Thank you, the joyful noise to the Almighty God. Daddy, you are welcome, sir. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, the Lord bless you and prepare you for an excellent ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking on excellence in life and ministry. God has the grace, is giving the promise, and we have to key in into that grace and hold on to the promise of God and do everything in our own strength, in our power, that will so link up with Christ, not with man, will link up with Christ and his grace will be abundant in our lives. And in every life, every family, every ministry, every church, every profession, every place we are will stand for Christ there. And that excellence in ministry and excellence in life will be projected everywhere we are in Jesus' name. So I invite you with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your attention, that you will hear what the Lord is saying and our ministers and workers, church workers, businessmen, professionals, all over the world that were connected now, I pray that the word of God will penetrate your heart. It will do something new and something different in every heart, every life, every ministry, and every profession in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We come before you. Bring in our heart, our soul, our mind, our skill, everything we have, so that, Lord, you will use us where we are, and you will use what we have, the rod in the hand of Moses, and the skill in the hand of your people. And we pray, Lord, that everywhere we find ourselves, we will have excellence in life excellence in ministry and we pray that your work will prosper in every hand in jesus name that that which you have ordained that which you desire will be reproduced in every life in every family in every community and in every profession in every church in jesus name be glorified this morning in your word and do wonders in the heart and the life of everyone. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down today. We're coming to the final message in the series we've been looking at. We've been looking at the life of Moses, the ministry of Moses. And you remember we spoke about the transferable concept that he is all that we have seen in Moses because it's the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God who led Moses and who raised him up, who helped him to be what he was. Is that same God was serving today? And is that same God that has impact, that has power, and that has penetration in every life? that he turns us around, he changes us, that we become the minister, the man, the professional, the father, the mother, the pastor, the preacher, that he wants us to be, and we shall be in Jesus' name. Today, as I come to this final session for the ministers and professionals, I'm talking on an extraordinary ministration to an exhausted minister an extraordinary ministration to an exhausted minister ministers need ministration themselves why because sometimes ministers are exhausted you can remember uh, moses when he came to the situation and he said have i given birth to these people i cannot bear their burden the man the minister moses was exhausted you remember when joshua fell on his face and said oh lord what am i going to do if these people run away from the enemy because they were 
defeated in air, a small city. And he said, if that happened to them, all the people around will gather around. They swallow us up. And the Lord said, get up, Joshua. There is sin in the camp. Until you deal with that, I will not go with you. The man was exhausted. The man was so depressed that he said, I cannot move on. You remember Elijah, the prophet of fire, when Jezebel said, go tell him, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to make your life like one of those people of the false prophets. I was surprised that even a man like Elijah could be exhausted. And that's the reason why you're a minister, you're a preacher, you, you have a ministry. There are times you get to the low ebb. There are times you get to the position where you need ministration yourself. You remember Paul the Apostle? He said, without are the fears, the fightings, and they were then are the fears. He said, we were even pressed to the wall as if we had the sentence of life. Then he said, the Lord that comforts all people, he came and he comforted us and he said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul the Apostle the Peter. And any of those other people could be so exhausted that they needed ministration from on high. We too, at our own time, both here in Ogoni land and in Nigeria, the whole of the country and Africa, the continent, and everywhere we find ourselves, we need the ministration of the Lord because there are times we get exhausted. And I pray that the flowing, overflowing power of the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord and the anointing of the Lord will flow into your life. And all the tiredness will vanish away. All the exhaustion will vanish away. All the depression will vanish away. Then you can rise up and stay and say, I can start all over again. And you are moving on and nothing will set you back again in Jesus' name. Now, you, you see this Moses, when the Lord spoke to him, he personally spoke to the Lord. You see, there are times when uh, there might be an Aaron and all that will raise up uh, his hand, but at other times, there are times when uh, a minister, though exhausted, a minister, though tired, will go to the presence of the Lord himself and he will wrestle. He will wrestle so that he will have the strength and the power and the spirit that he ought to have. You see, in our day, in our country here, in our continent, and all over the world, we are shifting a personal responsibility of taking ourselves, our problems to the Lord, and having divine solution. We have come to a pray for me generation, a eat for me generation, a drink for me generation, a breathe for me generation, a generation that feels that we cannot live except somebody does it for us. But to see those people, they had direct ministration from the Lord and Moses faced the Lord directly. It wasn't like, you know, Joshua, a young uh, preacher, I'm dying now, now, and can you can you help me and fast for me and pray for me and intercede for me? Are you praying for me, Pastor? I'm asking, are you praying for yourself? Do you take that problem to the Lord? And do you approach the throne of God by yourself and say, although I'm exhausted, although I'm fagged out, although I am kind of in fatigue spiritually, yet I will go to the Lord in prayer. Did you see Jesus when he was going to Calvary and at Gethsemane, he knelt down and he prayed and it was like Drops of blood were coming out of him. He personally approached the Father, and the Father sent an angel and strengthened him. And believing that as you seek the face of the Lord, as you call upon the Lord, that strength will come to you. 
that ministration will come to you and that power and the vision and the go-getting force in a man that is awakened by the Lord again that go-getting power and strength and anointing the Lord will give unto you in Jesus name an extraordinary ministration to an exhausted minister we're coming to Exodus and we're looking at chapter 33 I'm reading from verse 1 Exodus chapter 33 verse 1 and the Lord said unto Moses depart and go up hence thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and I will send an angel with a little small a there. Uh, you know, when you read the Old Testament, sometimes you say, I will send the angel with a capital A. And that will mean in Christophany, that he is a Christ appearing before he was born. In the New Testament, when you see that capital A, it means Christ, the one that is to come. But this one now, an angel before thee, and I will draw drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Then it says in verse 3, it says unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. What's God saying? God is saying, all right, I'm taking you out of Egypt I'm taking you to the land of Canaan. I'm taking you to the land flowing with milk and honey. I will still do that, but me, the Almighty, I'll not be with you. I will get you to that land because of the promise I made unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob. You'll be there, and you will live in all those prepared places, but I the God of heaven and the God of covenant, I, the one that brought you out of the land of Egypt, I myself will not go with you. That's why it says unto a land free with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. That was the thing that depressed Moses. He said, we're not just looking for land, we're looking for the Lord. We're not just looking for a place for him with milk and honey. We're looking for the one who is our Messiah, who is our God, our creator. The land is not going to satisfy us if you yourself, if you don't go with us. The milk and the honey will not satisfy us if you, our maker, our creator, if you do not go with us. That's why he was exhausted. And God said, but I cannot go with you. They're stiff-necked people. They're stubborn people. They're rebellious people. They're disobedient people. I can't go with you and keep on seeing the rebellion and the stiff neck and the stubbornness every day. As for lunch, I take you there. But I'm going to send an inferior person, a creature. I'm going to send one of the angels I created because me, the creator, I cannot go with you. That's why the minister, the Moses, the man became so exhausted, exasperated, and discouraged. And he said, I'll 
talk about this of the Lord. We cannot move a step further. We cannot move a day further except I have the assurance that he, the creator of the heavens and the earth, except I have the assurance he will go with us. I'm dividing the message today to three parts. Number one, the great disappointment in progress without the divine presence. We have progress, but is the divine presence there? And, oh, you say, maybe it's there. Let me remind you. Sometimes we put on the fan, the ceiling fan, and the thing is rolling and rolling and rolling at a great speed. And then we put off the light at the socket. And the fan, we look at it, it's still rolling. The power that generates the movement is turned off and the thing is still rolling. There are times when because of habit, because of practice, we've done it so much every time and we come to minister and the fan is still rolling but the source of power is cut off. We don't want a mechanical rotation, a mechanical ministry, a mechanical preaching, a mechanical praying, a mechanical a, a kind of a vigil when the light, the socket, had been turned off. That's why Moses said, no. We cannot go like that except the power, except the unction, except the anointing of the creator God in heaven, except you go with us. Number one, the great disappointment in progress without the divine presence. Number two, is the great desire and prayer. You see, Moses had a great, great desire. He said, when I saw you or met you at the burning bush, it was your voice I heard. And you said, I have come down to deliver the people out of their bondage. And then you said, I will go with you. I will be with your mouth. And that was the thing that moved me on. If you remove that presence now and you say go ahead and still have what you wanted to have no that's why he had this great desire and he had this great prayer for the divine presence number three the great declaration and promise of his divine presence he prayed he prayed he prayed until they heard the voice of God. Do you know the people, people, ministers who have lost the joy of salvation, the victory of salvation, and they have lost all the witness of the Spirit, and they still keep on, they still keep on. My duty, my work, my ministry. Or the heart is empty, the heart is dry, the ministry is dry, everything is dry, and the presence of the Lord is not visible there, but they say the people are expecting me, and the people are waiting. If I don't show up, even if God does not show up, it doesn't matter. If I don't show up, the people will be disappointed, and they go on like that for years. The Lord is saying, what are you doing? Well, the work of the Lord without the Lord of the work. You're so busy and you're sweating on the work of the Lord and yet the Lord of the work is not with you. That's, that's what we're learning from Moses that once we see that emptiness and we see that dryness and we see that the presence and the power, the unction that is fresh is no more there, we go back to Calvary and the and Calvary and Christ will renew everything in our lives in Jesus' name. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for everyone. The great declaration and promise of his divine presence. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the great disappointment in progress without the divine presence. We've read the verses already. We're looking at this under three subtitles. Number one, the disappointment of going 
with an angel, without the almighty angel, angel, angel. Disappointment of going with an angel without the almighty. Number two is the dissatisfaction of getting abundance, land of milk and honey, getting abundance without the almighty. There are people, they say, well, what else am I looking for? Presence of God, but I have a car, I have a house, I have, I'm sending my children overseas and, you know, they have been educated overseas and I didn't have that before I came to this profession. I didn't have that before I came to this ministry. And once now they have the money, they have the property, they have the land. Well, that the presence of God is there for them, that doesn't matter. But in case of Moses, he said, it's going to be a great uh, dissatisfaction if I get abundance, if the people get abundance and the presence of God of the Almighty is not with them. Number three, the delusion of growing advance the uh, delusion of going on and advancing and making progress without the almighty look at number one number one is the disappointment of going with an angel without the Almighty. Look at Exodus chapter 33, and I'm reading from verse 1 there. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go hence, thou and all the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and I I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, unto the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for I, the Almighty, will not go up in the midst of thee. An angel inferior to God will go with you. But the Almighty will not go with you. That's why Moses became disappointed. And he said, we cannot go on. We cannot move on except your presence will go with us. I'm going to ask you some questions. If an angel were assigned to you, the, the angels assigned to us, we know that. And if you were able to see him, and the Lord said that the angel, anything you need, you can communicate with him, and he will lead you there. But as for me, don't expect my personal revelation, and don't expect my personal uh, solution to your problem. The angel will take care of that. There are some people that will be, say, that's all right, that's all right, and they ask for the name of the angel, and anytime they are praying, they forget Jesus who died for us on the cross of Calvary. They forget the Almighty so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. They forget our maker, they forget our creator and all they are mentioning now angel Gabriel, angel Michael, angel this and they are praying to the angels and they are satisfied. Moses said I will not be satisfied. I will not be pleased to have an angel leading us he might even lead us aright. He might lead us to the land that is flowing with milk and honey. But I don't want an angel. I want the Almighty. I pray that will be your desire. And that will be your passion. That you are not being led by an angel. And you are not interested. What's the name of that angel? What's the name of that angel? What's the name of that angel? You are not interested in all those angels. Whoever 
they are, you are interested in the Almighty. You are interested in the Messiah. You are interested in our advocate, in the one that said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you. And whatsoever you ask the Father, not ask an angel, what, whatever you ask the Father in my name. That's our Savior. That's our Redeemer. He said that I will do. There are people that will come to us and say, you know, I discover the way. Now, it's very easy. I discovered a man. Anything I want, he'll do it for me. I'm not interested in that. I saw a man in the village. I saw a man in our local government and that man, he'll just, you know, make some things and make some sounds and then he will begin to prophesy and begin to tell me this and that. He will even tell me what happened yesterday, what happened last month. I'm not interested in that. I want the Almighty. Who do you watch? And so when they introduce you, they say there's one mama there, there's one woman there, she manufactures children. And so, uh, you know, so and so went there and they robbed the tummy, a <laughs> child came. Another one went there and they robbed the tummy, and the child came. And there are people that will leave Christ and leave the Almighty because they've discovered somebody somewhere in the corner there that will rob their belly and they'll have children. You're not just looking for children, you're looking for children from the Almighty. You're looking for a child like Samuel. You're looking for a child like John the Baptist. The child that will make something and do something and fulfill the will of God here on earth. We're not interested in just mere angels. We're interested in the Almighty God. And if you have been following an angel, today is the time to abandon that and say, Angel, get out of my way. You took the place of God in my life and you came between me and the almighty god get out of my way i want to have direct communication with the almighty he says come out from among them and be separate says the lord and touch not the unclean thing and I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Direct communication with the Almighty with no intermediary that is called an angel. I pray that that way and that clear path will be in your heart, in your life, in your ministry, in Jesus' name. We're coming to number two now. Number two is the dissatisfaction of getting abundance without the almighty what if somebody or a person not here appeared to you in the dream and said i see you have been praying and you have been calling god 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 almighty and all you want you want a job you want a wife you want children you want abundance you want a land flowing with milk and honey and that's why you've been fasting but now you don't need to fast i and then he introduces himself he has no connection with the Almighty. He has no connection with Christ, no connection with Calvary. And then he says, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. Name what you want, name it and claim it. It is yours. There are people, that's all they're looking for. The milk and the honey without the Almighty. Salvation that comes from the Almighty. The holiness of life that comes with the Almighty. The satisfaction that comes with the new nature, divine nature that the Almighty himself, that he gives us. But Moses said, I'm dissatisfied. I'm not going to have milk and honey without my maker and without the one my heritage that's the one i'm looking for when you come to that point in your life where physical blessing natural blessing natural provision whatever it is does not satisfy you 
but only the God of heaven will be your satisfaction, then you have a real definite experience with the Lord. Look at Exodus chapter 33, and I'm reading from verse 3. It says there, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, And when the people heard these evil tidings, hold on, hold on, hold on, evil tidings, what's evil tidings? You're going to have milk, that's evil tidings. And you're going to have honey, that's evil tidings. You're going to go to the land of the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Parasites, all of them, but you will not have the divine presence, that absence of the divine presence and divine power, the absence of a creator God in heaven that makes the milk and the honey evil tidings. Provision, power, position, high place, profession, progress without the divine presence. That's what the people understood to be the evil tiding. It's like, you know, a husband telling the wife and saying, looks like our relationship is mechanical. It's like, you know, anytime you're happy, I see what makes you happy. The food money is there. The, you know, rent is paid. And everything you have, you ask, you all, once you have it, you are happy. And once there's five minutes delay, and you don't have it, you know, at this time, the time you like, it's like everything is turned upside down. Your smile is gone, and your good attitude is gone. Once you don't have this, I see that it's not really me you love. It's what you get from me that you love. All right, I'll make the money available. I'll make, um, you know, food available. I'll make everything available. Only one thing, uh, myself, because you want to turn me to a slave. Just, yes, madam. Yes, ma yes, dear. Yes, honey. What do you want? You want me only to be the yes man, not the husband. And once I said, I'm not going to be the yes man anymore, everything turns around. Okay, all the money you want, and all the food you want, and all the dresses you want, and all everything you want, I give to you, but I withdraw myself. You know, there are women that will say, okay, <laughs> if money is going to come, and that wasn't actually after you you know, in my mind, is because of what I get from you. And what I get through you, that's why I'm still in this relationship. And if you're still going to provide this, this, and that, and yourself, you pull away, they say they're all right. Moses said, I'm not all right. Can somebody say, I'm not all right? <laughs> we need the Almighty. It's not just abundance, it's not just provision, it's not just milk and honey, it's not just the sand and the cement that people dig up, it's not the gold and the silver, it's not all the physical things that he gives us when he gives us himself. And he says, I myself, I will go with you. That is what we're looking for. The disappointment and dissatisfaction of getting abundance without the Almighty. We're looking at Mark chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 8, we're reading from verse 36. So what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. What does it profit a man? If he shall have all the money he wants, if he shall have all the luxury and the conveniences he desires, if he shall have all the properties of this world, and you will say, praise the Lord, I'm in church, although I'm not, I'm not as holy as I ought to be. I'm in the church, I know I'm not as close to God as I ought to be, but 
but you know, money is coming in, and friends are coming in, and marriage is happening, and children are coming in. I have all this. The only thing I'm, I don't even think I'm missing that, since money answers all matters, and I have all the money that answers all my requests, even though the Almighty is not there, Christ is not there, what I have uh, satisfies me. That's what Jesus said, and he said, what shall it profit a man, a woman? What shall it profit a so-called believer? What shall it profit a so-called minister if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Then in verse 37, it tells us, it says, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Were you to have all the money, all the material things in the world, and you don't have that attachment, you don't have that reconciliation, and you don't have that sense of belonging unto the Lord of all men, of all women, you'll be the most miserable. Look at number three here. Number three here is the delusion the deceptiveness of growing and having advance without the Almighty, advance without the Almighty, success without the Savior, and getting to the peak without having the pardon and the peace of God. Moses is revealing to us and he's telling us that whatever we have on earth, if we don't have the presence of the Almighty, it is not enough. The spirit is dead, the soul is empty, and the life does not have a link, a connection with the Almighty. Whatever you have on earth, it's nothing. You know, since I came to the ministry, I've, I've been so prospered and I've been so uh, kind of desirable. They give me invitation from Germany, from uh, Japan, from China, from Taiwan, from everywhere. <laughs> okay, but you understand, the more you go out there, out there, the less you cannot pray now as we used to pray 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Doesn't that bother you? You are here, you are there, and the same thing you said in uh, that place when they invited you brushed up your notes, and the divine presence is not there, the unction is not there, and then you come, is it Japan, is it, uh, you know, where are you now? And then you look at them, and those people have never heard that thing because you preach that thing nine times, ten times here, there, and everywhere, and then when you come, you stand like you normally stand, and you do the rigmarole and all the gymnastics and the people think it's a great thing but God is not there it's shallow it's a repetition and he doesn't have the unction he doesn't have the revelation and you're just there and you carry on like that now if you can carry on without Christ if you can carry on without the Almighty, and if you can say exactly the same thing. And you know, sometimes the problem is with us Pentecostals. And when we were baptized in the Holy Ghost, we spoke in tongues. And that language, what you spoke in tongues, became recorded into your mind. That's your media, your inner media there. And anytime you come, it's not a new thing. It's not a new outburst and auction. The recorded tape of that tongue comes out again and you say praise the Lord but you know his tongue without the anointing without the unction and without a fresh revelation from the Lord are you satisfied with that and our church they're satisfied with that and while the preacher the pastor the Pentecostal man of the hour once he takes the microphone and then he rattles off in that same 
old tongue. All the members in the church, they hear that every time, and they too, they begin to repeat the same thing. And I, I, I challenge that member, and I say, are you filled? Are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? He says, yes, yes, yes. Uh, let me speak in tongues for you. And then he speaks in tongues, a repetition of what he got from the microphone, from the pastor. There's no anointing there. There's no passion there. And there is nothing there. It said they shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon them, and they shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. They are not witnesses. It's just the parrot tongue without the Almighty. The church has gone on for a long time, having all this advance and all this progress and all this growth and everything without the fresh anointing of the Almighty. Today, everything has to change. I said everything has to change. The illusion, the illusion of growing and the illusion of having advanced without the Almighty. I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and reading from verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon upon a woman with his child, and they shall not escape. Those are the people that superficially on the surface, they're saying peace and safety. That's what they said yesterday. Peace and safety, and the termites are eating the very foundation of their faith, and they still keep on peace and safety. We need to forsake all that and go back to the foundation and seek the face of the Lord and say whatever we have, and whatever we profess, the Almighty must be at the very center of our experience. It tells us in verse 4 there, in verse 4 it says, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should come, should overtake you as a thief. And then in verse 5 it says, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night night nor of darkness. You'll not be of the night. You'll not be of darkness. You'll not be just carrying on. Hey, you know sometimes in darkness, the light is not on. Well, I'm looking for something. And I know where I always keep that thing because if you have the habit that this particular object, you always keep it on the side table of the bed. This other one, you always keep it in the first drawer. If you have practiced that now, when you're looking for that thing and there's no light, you know where that thing is, you just put your hand and you take it, but there's no light. And then you know the drawer that you are going to draw, and as you draw and you take that thing, wouldn't it be better if we understand that many of the things we're doing, we do by habit. The light is not on. There is darkness there, and there is, there is no leading of God. There's no guidance of God. There is no voice from heaven. There is no voice of God in our soul. There is no voice or the witness of the Spirit of God, but habitually. We know that that's where I always put that thing. I take it. Would you say I need the light? I don't want my life to just be on habit, habit, habit. I said it yesterday, I say it today. I said it last week, I'm saying it this week. I'm, I went that direction. You already know the way you've been driving on that road for a long time. And even though you're sleepy, even though you're answering the phone, you can tell the pitfall is there, pitfall is there, and you avoid. There's no guidance. Isn't it good for the church? Isn't it good for the ministers? Isn't it good 
good for the members to say, Lord, it's not just that we're advancing. It's not just that we're moving. We need your guidance. We need to go beyond the habit that we have developed so that we're not walking in darkness, but we are walking in the light. The Lord help you to be sensitive to the guidance of the Lord in Jesus' name. I need a greater amen over there. Amen. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two, the great desire and prayer for his divine presence. The great desire and prayer for his divine presence. We're coming to Exodus and we're looking at chapter 33. We're reading from verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people and thou, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me, yet thou saidst, I know thee by name, and hast also found grace in my sight. We're coming back to Moses. Now, you remember, Moses had spent 40 years in that desert he knew some of the places there if you've been doing something for 40 years you know if i take that way to the right it leads to such and such a village if i take that way to the left it leads to such and such a community once i begin to see these signs i know the giants are nearby he's been there for 40 years and yet he will not depend on the past knowledge of the 40 years. He had experience. He had understanding. He knew some of the way. But he said, we still need the Almighty. The same thing with us. Once you're you old enough, 30 years of age, 50 years of age, 70 years of age, and you have been you know, doing this and that, you already have some things stored in your system. But all the same, with everything you have, you say, I need the new anointing of the Lord at the new directives of the Lord and I need the impartation afresh in my life it is that desire that makes us to take time apart and to pray and to seek the face of the Lord and to say habit skill uh, performance whatever everything you've been doing in the past will not suffice for an excellent ministry an excellent life and so he wanted the guidance of the lord look at verse 13 in verse 13 it says now therefore i pray thee if i have found grace in thy sight and uh, show me now thy way that I may know that, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. The great desire he had and the great prayer he prayed. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the personal prayer for divine presence. Personal prayer. When last did you have personal prayer? Pulpit prayer, great. Pastor's prayer for you, great. The prophet's prayer for you, wonderful. But personal prayer. The prayers we have, uh, public prayer, as we gather together, somebody standing there, pronounce a blessing on me. Great. Personal prayer for the divine uh, presence. Number two, pastoral prayer for the divine presence. There are times the pastor has to pray. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And they are anointing, announce, uh, anointing with oil and pray for him. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Yes, pastoral 
prayer for divine presence. Number three, his prevailing prayer for divine presence. Number one, we're looking at number one there. The personal prayer for divine presence. We have read each in Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 and 13. Look at Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, we're reading from verse 11. Psalm 51, we're reading from verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. Here is David. David was having a personal prayer. You know, Nathan was there as the prophet. And Nathan was not far away. And Nathan said, see what you've done. Because you've done this, this is the judgment that will come. David could have said, prophet, don't go away. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Nathan, pray for me. You know, that, that's some kind of prayer some people know they cannot go to God themselves. Nathan cannot repent for you and Nathan will not know the depths of your conviction that's why although the prophet was there who could have prayed for him this man took the need his guilt his condemnation and his confession he took it to the Lord in prayer he said in sin was I born in sin did my mother conceive me? You desire truth in the inward man against you and against you only. Have I committed this, uh, this trespass? He had personal prayer. That's what the Lord is telling us. He said, when last did you appear before me to pray personally? Not the habitual prayer. God, thank you for this morning and thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. You're a great, wonderful God. You're blessing us. You bought our bread and sugar, our tea, and you're a great, great God. Praise the Lord. That's what you said yesterday. That's what you said the other day. That's what you said the other week. That's what you said last year. When are you going to have a personal, personal prayer and you're going to say, God, look at my life. It's rotting in this area. It's terrible in this area. The things that come to my mind and the things I do, I cannot imagine a real child of God doing this. And personally, you want a divine touch and you want a divine presence personal prayer for the divine presence. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not the Holy Spirit for me. Look at verse 12. It says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. There's confusion now and there is sadness now. There is grief now. There is condemnation now and I stand in doubt of my salvation. Restore unto to me the joy of thy salvation and hope uphold me with thy free spirit. Look at verse 13. Then will I teach. Then will I teach. What does that mean? Restore the joy of salvation unto me until that is done. Restore the victory in salvation unto me. Restore the freedom I used to have. Restore the power I used to have. Restore the assurance I used to have that you are with me. And clear this confusion. And clear this doubt. And clear this condemnation. And put me on the right path. On my way to heaven again then and only then uh, what was the use of coming to lead other people to heaven and you're not sure of heaven yourself what's the use of telling other people the joy of the lord is your strength and you don't have the joy yourself what's the use of talking to other people to have assurance and you don't have the assurance yourself what's the use of talking about victory 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 for other people and you're defeated in your own personal spiritual life the man said restore unto me the joy of thy salvation only then after that will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee praise the Lord
And that's a man, that's a man that didn't count sitting on the throne at the final thing. Being number one in the nation of Israel as the final thing. Having the name, having the position, having the authority to judge other people at the final thing. He said, after all, the throne, once I quit and once I leave, everything is over. But what will recommend me to God in eternity is not the throne upon which I sit, the joy and the assurance assurance of salvation and therefore lord personal prayer restore to me the joy of your salvation and then will i teach others transgress us your way and sinners shall be converted unto thee i'm looking at number two here number two is the pastoral prayer for the divine presence look at exodus chapter 33 and we're reading from verse 15 exodus Chapter 33, verse 15, and he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Me, if your presence does not go with me, and I have the assurance that the Almighty is with me, that I'm not just laboring, I'm not just guiding the people, I'm not just leading the people without your guiding hand in my life, carry us not up Hence, don't take us to the land through an angel, and don't take us to that place filled with milk and honey through an angel. Your very presence must carry us from here. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, For wherein shall it be known that here, that I and thy people, I and thy people, I and thy people have found grace in thy sight is it not in that thou goest with us pastoral prayer is it not that thou goest with us the times when you've been preaching your hearts out and you look at your congregation and you see that in the congregation there's a lot a lot of spiritual problems the people, that one is divorcing her wife, his wife. That one is separating and running away from the husband. That one is, uh, you know, throwing the children out to the wolves. That other one is doing some a kind of a business that is all fraud. And that one is to, to internet uh, crime. And you look at the whole congregation. Well, there are things that people do you they say it looks like my ministry is finished here with all i preach and with all that i do the lives of the people are still like this my ministry is finished and then they decide a particular day when they will come and hand over the letter of resignation and they'll say congregation i've done my best what else could i have preached and you're still the way you are i'm going to another place they're going to establish a new ministry in that new ministry, sinners will come, backsliders will come, rebellious people will come, and the lesson you didn't learn here, over there, that lesson will show up again and say, what am I going to do? Are you going to quit the ministry completely? Are you not going to have pastoral prayer and say, Lord, change these people, transform these people, take these people from this situation and take them to that situation? That's what Moses did. He prayed unto the Lord and he said, you will go with us. Your presence, your power, your transforming power will go with us. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. I pray that this mind and this same heart, whatever is happening in your personal life, personal prayer in your pulpit ministry then you have the pastoral prayer that every problem will be solved by prayer in your ministry in your life in jesus name Amen. now in the family you have 
a ministry. If you are the Christian mother there, you have a ministry. Maybe the husband has gone off into drinking, has gone off with you know, another woman, is messing up his life, and the children are taking after their father, and you are the priestess there, and you are the leader there, you are the intercessor there. You're not going to say... I call the man, let's go to church. I say, church, what do I have to do with the church? I say, you know, let, let's read the Bible together. Bible, you believe the Bible, you go ahead and read the Bible. And I say, hey, can we take the problem of the family to the Lord this time and pray and fast? Fast. Even the food I've been eating every day is not enough. You want me to fast? I'm sorry. I cannot fast. And then you go back and you close your Bible. You close your mind to God and you begin to think, what will I do? And your friend, a lady friend told you, I see that you are facing fire in your family. You're right, you're right. You know, if I were you, I will quit the place. If I were you, look at the woman talking. If I were you, it's not you. And you are not her. She doesn't have God, but you have God. I have God. You will take the problem of that family and God will answer your prayer. You take it to the Lord in prayer. If you have to fast alone, if you have to pray alone, and you have to say, my family will not continue like this, God will answer your prayer. But you know, you know, as we just go about problem, 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 talk, 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 gossip, 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 murmuring, 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 grumbling, 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 and complaining, complaining, complaining. I talk to the mother-in-law, I talk to the father-in-law, I talk to everybody, and things are still like this. You talk to everybody, but you didn't talk to God. It's when you take the problem and you take the problem of the family and you take it to the Lord in prayer and you wrestle and you wrestle not with flesh and blood, not with your husband, not with the children, not with the wife, not with anybody. You are wrestling against the principalities and powers, militating against your family. God will answer your prayer. What if we do less talking to men, less complaining to men, less murmuring among men, and we talk more to God? What if we stop all the going around and all the texting, texting, or chatting on your phone? I'm going through this, I'm going through this. What instead of telling man, we tell God everything will turn around in our families in Jesus' name. Uh, there are times in your profession, in the work you are doing, you find that you are making progress like this and you are climbing up, and now at this time things are going down maybe you're foreseeing it is the economy and then economy other people around you then the same economy and they're making progress and they're doing all their sales and everything but just going down and down and down and then you're doing consultation you're attending um, you know conferences that will make your business to boom after all the conferences and consultations everything is still going down and down and then you are complaining, you are murmuring, we don't know what this country is coming to. We don't know what is happening to our economy. We don't know what the government is doing. Well, in that same country, other people are making it. You must make it. Yeah. So, what do you do? We stop all the going around and all the talking and all saying, you know, economy, government, something. And then your prayer will turn everything around in your business, in your profession, in Jesus' name. 
You employ people. You employ this one, employ that one, employ that one. And you trusted in this that he will be the treasurer. He'll be the person taking the money to the bank and coming back. And you saw that by the time. You didn't, you didn't think you're going to have any auditor because you know the man. I know the man is from our place. We speak the same language. I know the mother. I know the father. Before you know, he has taken millions away and he has absconded. You can't even tell where he is. And then you employ another person. They do the same thing. Don't you know? When that same problem is coming over and over and over and you're doing all you can do by the effort of man and things are not changing, that's why we need prayer. And as you pray for that company, as you pray for that firm, as you pray and you report everything happening to the Lord, the Lord will fish out all the culprits and by themselves he'll flush them out in Jesus name and then we can make progress number one is personal prayer number two is pastoral prayer number three is prevailing prayer for the divine presence prevailing prevailing prayer for the divine presence we're looking at exodus chapter 33 and we're looking at verse 17 exodus chapter 33 we're looking at verse 17 and the lord said unto moses i will do this thing also that thou hast spoken what an assurance and what settlement in his life that now he knew that God has answered the prayer. When you are praying, when do we stop praying? You are asking and asking and asking, when do you stop praying? The Lord has showed us men ought always to pray and not to faint. And this woman came to the judge, avenge me of mine enemies. And the judge feared not God, nor regarded man, and did nothing. And the woman came again. That's the story of Jesus. That's what he said. That's the parable. He, she came again. And the man said he wasn't going to do anything and she came again and then eventually said this woman will weary me if i don't answer her and because of her importunity that judge answered her that is when you stop praying you are asking for this and it has not been done ask again it's not been done. Ask again. Ask with faith and clear the way and see if there is anything that is hindering that prayer. And when you remove all those hindrances and you depend upon the promise of God alone, the Lord will answer your prayer. And it is when we have that prevailing level power of the prayer that will stop the praying and the Lord said unto Moses said unto Moses Moses spoke to God and God spoke to him is a two-way communication that was speaking to God and now he speaks to our heart more so in this new testament in this new covenant if he did that for them under the old covenant how much more but when last did God speak to you maybe a long time why because you are satisfied with not hearing the voice of God, with not hearing or having assurance from God, and just live your life from day to day without hearing from him, Moses will not do that. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight and i know thee by name we'll come to point number three now point number three we're looking at the great declaration and promise of his divine presence look at us, um, exodus chapter 33 and we're reading from verse 14 exodus chapter 43 
I was reading from verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give you rest. God said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. The Lord had said earlier in this same chapter, I will not go with you. An angel will go with you. There are some people, they say, that's God, who am I? God has said, I'm not going to go with you. An angel will go with you. And he said, because it's God, he has said what he will do. The Lord said that to get your reaction, to get your response. That's not final. When God said, Abraham, I'm going to Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to see what they have done. If it is so indeed, Abraham did not say, that's God, that's God. He has decided and he has spoken what you will do. The Lord tells us that so that we can take on in prayer and seek the face of the Lord. And Abraham came near unto God and said, God, if you find 50 righteous people there, will you spare the city? And God said, yes, I will. I have about 40 people. Yes, I will. I have about 30 people. Yes, I will. I have about 20 people. Yes, I will. I but if you see 10 people there that are righteous, will you spare them? The God of all the world, of all the earth, will you not do right? And God said, I will. And uh, Abraham stopped the prayer. He should have continued. What if you see five there? What if you see only one there? Like Moses. Moses, when he was interceding for Israel, he didn't talk about 50 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10. He just said, you are the God of mercy and the God of compassion. Forgive the people and count the people as your people. And that's what we need to do. So that a great declaration and a promise will come from the Almighty of His divine presence. Look at verse 17. In verse 17 the Lord said unto Moses I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for thou hast found grace in my sight and I know thee by name I pray that such declaration will come as we take our problems our challenges to the Lord in prayer in Jesus name and the church said, yeah. Amen. Three things we're looking at. Number one here. Number one, the gracious promise of his divine presence. The gracious promise of his divine presence. Number two, the great power in his divine presence. Number three, the glorious permanence of his divine presence. We're coming to number one. Number one, the gracious promise of his divine presence presence. We have read that in Exodus chapter 33 from verse um, 14. We're looking at Joshua now. Joshua chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 5. There shall no, not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Amen. That amen does not match the promise. Amen. You know, you hear stories they say this one is easy ground of ministry and they say this one is a more difficult ground of ministry they say that place where they are is tough like somebody said the place he is now where he's ministering is the toughest place he has ever seen on the face of the earth did you see the promise there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life Anywhere God calls you to minister, even if he calls you like Jonah to go to Nineveh, even though it might be the toughest place on earth, at that time no man shall be able to stand before you. No man of any power, of occultic power, of dark power, 
of satanic power. No man of any idolatrous power shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. You know, but people, they look at the faces of men. They come to a community to minister, and they, they go around, they are doing surveillance. They are doing a kind of survey. And they're looking at the kind of people in the land. And the people, they see, they see the men, they're tough, and, you know, their faces are enough to drive somebody out of the village. And they see another, even a woman, and, you know, her muscles like that of a real strange man and this is this where i have come and then they go to pray again oh god i, I think i miss my place the people here i cannot reach them you will reach them yeah. because no matter what it is and no matter who they are and no matter how they have trained themselves to confront you and to come against you there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Now, in our ministry, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, you were bold and you were authoritative. And anywhere you went, you went with your mind, you went with the message, and you went with determination. The Lord sent me here, and I'm going to achieve. And then and you, you achieved. But now, 15 years after, as you are coming, you are trembling. As you are coming, you are fearful. As you are coming, you are timid. As you are coming, your heart is palpitating. Why? You have forgotten the promise of God. God is still the same. The promises are still the same. And it's still the same in power as ever. It's because we have forgotten the promise of God. That's why we're shivering now. That's why we're fearful now. That's why, why we're discouraged now. And that's why we're timid now. And that's why we're thinking, I cannot, I cannot, but thank God I can. In that same place, I can. In that same territory, I can. Why? Because the God who made the promise is still as mighty and powerful as ever. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Looks like it looks like when people are tired, then they look for some reasons and they say, you know, our ministry, our church, our organization, I see that, you know, now my inner man is not as strong as it used to be, is because you are looking away from the promise of God. And then I see that even my stamina now cannot carry me. It's the fear inside you that is weakening your knees and weakening your legs. And then you say, uh, can I ask for voluntary retirement at this time? Fear. Fear will not drive you away. Yeah. Timidity will not drive you away. Yeah. You know, the fear in you can make you older than your age. You're just 57 and you look like you're already 70. Why? The fear inside you. That's why your legs cannot carry you. That's why your voice cannot come up again. That's why your vision is going dream. But the Lord will fulfill his promise in your life today in Jesus' name. That there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so... I will be with thee. Yeah. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Yeah. A great amen. Yeah. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, This book of the law, in our own case now, the book of the Lord. This book of the law of the Lord shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that have written therein. 
For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You will prosper. Amen. And then thou shalt have good success. Amen. I will have good success. Amen. Good success? What's bad success? Any success that takes the presence of God away from you and you don't mind, that's bad success. Any success that takes the desire for heaven from you, that's bad success. Any success that takes heaven entirely from you and you have to go to that secret papa to get something charm and to plant it around the pulpit so that you will succeed any success that is brought by the worms of what you buried at the pulpit that's bad success it will lead you to hell but good success the good success is the success that god gives and heaven is still there and holiness is still there and faith in God is still there and the desire to move on and the vision to fulfill the will of God is still there you have that kind of good success in Jesus name it tells us in Isaiah chapter 41 Isaiah chapter 41 we're looking at verse 10 it says fear thou not for I am with thee be not dismayed for I am thy God I will strengthen thee yea I will help thee yea I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness look at verse 14 in verse 14 it says fear not that warm Jacob and ye men of Israel I will help thee says the Lord thy redeemer the holy one of Israel. That promise will never fail in your life and will never fall out of your life in Jesus' name. Amen. I come to point number two here. Point number two, the great power in the divine presence. The great power in the divine presence. Jeremiah chapter 32, and we're reading from verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 32, reading from verse 17. And ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm and there is nothing too hard for thee in his wisdom it will help you in his power it will help you whatever the situation whatever the circumstance he is the one that made the earth and the heaven by his great power and nothing is too hard for him it will help you this day it will turn every negative thing around and things will be prosperous and things will be in the proper way with his power in your life in Jesus name. Look at number three here. Number three we're looking at the glorious permanence of his divine presence. The glorious permanence of his divine presence. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 5, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness. You're, you're talking to a neighbor. Let your conversation be without confusion. You're talking to anybody in your ministry, anybody outside your ministry. Let your conversation be without covetousness. What's covetousness? So and so has this. I also want that. No. Let's say, for example, here you're ministering, and you are ministering in that local government. And then you've heard about a minister that has aircraft, aeroplane. And you say, I, I, I'm serving God. The same God is serving. The same God I'm serving. And I'm going to serve God here. He has an airplane, aeroplane. I must have an aeroplane. My brother, where are you flying to? 
And where is the airport in that local government? Well, we just ask if he has this, therefore I must have that. The Lord will give you everything that will make you successful in your ministry and in your place. The Lord will give him that other man, there's airport where he's ministering and where he wants to go. There's airport there. Maybe he needs aircraft so he can get there at, at the appropriate time. And the Lord has given him what will make him successful where he is and where you are. If you don't need a plane, you need a boat. The Lord will give you the boat. If you don't need that, you need a bicycle, motorcycle, the Lord will give you what you need. You need a car, a jeep, that will be able to take the rough road there, the Lord will give you. He doesn't just give everything to everybody. He knows your need. He knows your calling. He knows where you are ministering. And let your conversation, let your prayer, let your demand, let your request be without covetousness. Be content with such things as she have. For he he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Permanent presence of the Lord. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave me. You go to a strange land, he'll never leave you. You get to a familiar place, he'll never leave you. You get to a not so familiar place, the Lord will be with you. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Look at verse 6, it says in verse 6, so that we may boldly say, confidently say, we may assuredly say, we may persuasively say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Say amen. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Amen. Amen. Many times we imagine evil more than good. We've come to a particular place. Instead of reading the Bible and reading the promises of God and knowing the nature of God, we're asking questions about this place. What power do they have? And what evil do they do? Tell me. The preachers that have come here before me, what did they do to them? And you hear stories and stories and stories. And then all those stories, they ground you. Because what you hear and what you expose yourself to has brought the fear of man and the fear of woman and the fear of the powers that be in your heart. Why don't you block that away from your memory? Why don't you block that away from your mind and then go and see what God has said and then you can come to God and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Can you say that? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear. Fear is personal. I will not fear. Fear. Two people, two people may be in the same place, looking at the same thing, hearing the same thing, feeling the same thing, and one of them has no fear. The other one is eating up with fear. Why? Because even though they see the same thing, they hear the same thing. They even feel the same thing. This other one is in his own heart. He said, if anybody does not fear in this condition, the fellow will be eaten up or be destroyed. The other fellow says, if anybody fears in this condition, he does not know the presence of his God. And because they think in different ways, this other one is 
crushed by fear and this other one is elevated by faith it's what you say to yourself whatever you hear whatever you see whatever you feel all around there you can confidently assuredly and you can you can say with real persuasion i will not fear what man shall do unto me my god is nearer than any man Nearer to me than any woman. Nearer to me than any problem. Therefore, I can confidently come to the presence of the Lord and I can say, God, I'm sorry I ever feared in my life. I'm sorry I ever trembled in the presence of any man. Now I know that you are with me and your presence will never leave me. And therefore, I make up my mind I will not fear, I will never fear what man shall do unto me. And when you do that, you release yourself to the power of the presence of God. Because God knows now you are all for him and you fear nothing because you believe in your God. And this morning the Lord is calling you and he's saying, erase everything you have been saying, everything you have been saying in fear, everything you've been saying in timidity, all the way you have been trembling and you're almost running out of ministry because of them because of this and because of that and then you turn around and you say now i know i can boldly say the lord is my helper are you there the lord is my helper the lord is my helper i will not fear i will not fear what man shall do unto me we're moving up today we're going on today we're moving from victory unto victory today and we're going to have success even today because now we have his presence the promise of his presence the power of his presence and the performance of his presence in our lives and your life your ministry your family will never be the same again in jesus name let's rise up now let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord here here am I, I come. 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 Let his presence go with you. Don't be satisfied with just abundance. Don't be just satisfied by an angel. Don't be satisfied with advance. Let the presence of the Almighty, the power of the Almighty, and the intimacy with the Almighty be with you, abide with you, and then you move on in ministry.